Eldritch Blast is fucking awesome. So awesome, in fact, it inspired me to solo the game on the hardest difficulty, which at the time of recording this was Tactician. I know, I know, it took me a while. Next video we'll do Honor Mode, but for now let's get into the build. For race, we go with human. I could lie and say I did it for the shield proficiency, but in reality I just like being the underdogs of fantasy. For spells, we take Eldritch Blast and the rest don't matter, and for subclass we go with the Great Old One. I think Fiend is technically better, but I went with the Great Old One for two reasons. One, I think this script is going to be a hell of a lot easier to write if I can cram it full of Lovecraftian hentai jokes every ten seconds. And two, when the endless cycle of quick saving, dying, and quick loading inevitably pushes my mind to the brink of insanity, I can play it off as just role-playing the character really well. With that out of the way, let's get this rolling. Our adventure begins, as it so often does, with us crawling our way out of a Mind Flayer's incubation pod and our newly acquired tadpole doing kickflips on the inside of our skull. We take about five steps before a dead man's brain starts speaking telepathically into our mind. That's kind of fucking weird, so we put our thumbs in it until it quiets down. Five steps later, and we meet our first would-be companion, Lazelle. I'm not too sure what her deal is, but she's a badass space warrior, and she hates mind flayers, so we're off to a good start. We kill a few imps together in what could have been the beginning of an adventure-long partnership. Unfortunately for her, though, the voices in my head had other plans. Next up on our list of missed connections is Shadowheart, a half-elven priestess stuck in a similar pod to the one we just crawled out of, so we bust her out of it and the two of us take turns casting spells at one another until it's time to move on. If you were watching a better video, now would be the part where I tell you we kick Jalk's ass and take the Everburn Blade for ourselves. Unfortunately for you though, you're with me today, so instead you get that half-ass joke and this picture of an elephant sucking its own dick. <laughs> Free at last from the tutorial mission, we wake up on the beach and our thirst for blood has only begun. We heroically defend ourselves from this group of intellect devourers and not so heroically murder Astarion in cold blood before making our way to the Emerald Grove. On our way though, we take a quick break to turn this Mind Flayer into fertilizer and hit level 2. When we do arrive at the Emerald Grove, we find it to be under attack by a group of goblins. Now, this fight should be really hard, but fortunately for us, there are a lot of friendly NPCs around. Most notably this guy, Will. He's a human warlock like us, and I really hope nothing bad ever happens to him. After filling the goblin raiders with enough eldritch energy to power a car, we head inside the Emerald Grove and see what awaits us. It's your typical, you know, picking up side quests, talking to shopkeepers, executing prisoners... Wait, what? War crimes aside, when all is said and done, we end up leaving the Emerald Grove with some shiny new equipment and enough XP to put us right on the cusp of third level. The thing about being right on the cusp of a level up is it makes you very hungry for experience points. Unfortunately for these fine gentlemen over here, they happen to be made of experience points, so we drop a cinder block on their head, and their friends seem pretty chill, so we let them go. I'm kidding, of course. We blast them to pieces. Level 3 sees us gain access to higher level spells and a Pact Boon, so we pick up the Darkness spell and Pact of the Chain. Darkness, because it combos well with our Devil Sight, and Pact of the Chain, mostly by process of elimination. Books are for fucking nerds, and our AC is way too low to be fighting anything in melee. I think Imp is technically the more powerful of the two enhanced familiars, but I end up picking Quasit to fit the theme of the character. Let's be honest, one of these looks like it was pried from the darkest recesses of human insanity, and the other looks like something you dress a hamster as for Halloween. So we're going with Quasit. With our new familiar by our side and a darkness spell in hand, we venture forth into what many lone wolf runners consider to be one of the hardest fights in the game, and absolutely fucking body it. This fight gets most of its challenge from the fact that the majority of enemies are archers or spellcasters, so it's impossible to really kite them anywhere. That ends up working against them when we throw down the darkness spell, and all the ranged enemies stand around like dickheads waiting to get their heads blown off. This one barbarian's brave enough to run into the cloud and challenge us, but he can't hit what he can't see and we take him out in a few turns. By the time we lose concentration on our spell, there's only two enemies left, and we end up taking them out the old-fashioned way. Next up on the list of difficult encounters are these skeleton guys guarding withers. I'll be honest, I've never done one of these lone wolf runs before, so I wasn't exactly sure what the optimal strategy here was. I ended up spending way too much real life time setting up this elaborate trap complete with barrels and nautiloid tanks. I accounted for everything. 
Except the fact that when these guys died, they must have had their fucking balls rot off, because not a single one of them actually ran towards me. They ended up going for this dash into the corner strategy. I'm not too sure what they were thinking, but my counter to it was to draw on my FPS experience and just peek shot the shit out of them. Also, I'm sorry for the amount of times you've had to listen to my character yell Delor, but not really, because it's nothing compared to the amount of times I've had to listen to it. With the skeletons dead and Withers taking his rightful place as the first and only permanent NPC in our adventuring camp, we are out of spell slots, out of short rests, and just about out of hit points, so now seems like as good a time as any to take our first long rest of the campaign. We wake up bright and early, feeling confident in ourselves after yesterday's successful grave robbings, and start making our way towards the goblin camp that Zevlor told us about. First though, we have to pass the Blighted Village. Taking out all these goblins at once would be, at best, extremely difficult, and at worst, completely suicidal. Fortunately though, it's quite easy to sneak around and take them out in groups of two or three at a time. Before we can finish mowing them all down though, we find ourselves face to face with this group of ogres, and I'll be honest, they scare the shit out of me. Luckily for us though, they end up being pretty reasonable and chill guys, especially the leader. He gives us a sick ass trumpet and sends us on our way. The final encounter of the Blighted Village is a group of goblins that have tied this poor gnome to a windmill. I don't feel like letting this gnome die, but I also don't feel like fighting ten goblins at once, so I tell them to fuck off, and they listen. I love charisma-based characters. Despite our successes so far, I'm still not entirely confident we can take out the goblin camp in our current state, so we go looking for some miscellaneous encounters to get some more XP, and perhaps one or two magic items to help us on the way. We say hi to Raphael kill a few gnolls, and rescue Counselor Floric from a burning building. She rewards us in turn with the Spell Sparkler, a magical quarterstaff that grants the wielder lightning charges every time they land an attack roll. As a warlock who spams Eldritch Blast every turn, we make a lot of attack rolls, so we graciously accept and set our sights on the goblin camp. Once we get here, we bluff our way past the perimeter guards, get Volo put in timeout, and make our way to the interior of the camp where we can start hunting down the three leaders. Priestess guts up first, we follow her into what apparently is her own plan for an ambush, but we get the jump on her. With our closet hiding invisibly behind her and us sneaking off to the side, we're able to take her down before the surprise condition even wears off. Wanting to get the most out of the hex spell we cast on Priestess Gut, we take a quick stop into Volo's timeout corner, murder the two guards standing by, and unlock him. We'll have use for him later. After that, we pay a visit to everybody's favorite cleric of Loviatar, and get whipped for a little bit. Stop looking at me like that, you'd have done it too, the blessing is awesome. In fact, he whips us so hard we reach level 4, which is great! We get our first feat of the campaign, and quickly spend it on increasing both our charisma and constitution score. More damage, better hit points, and an improved concentration save. I just wish my ass didn't hurt. Next up is Halson. We chose to do Halson next because he's closer to us than the two other points of interest in the camp, but don't worry, we don't plan to actually use him to clear the rest of it, he's just inevitable in the fight where you free him. Just like that, we're back up on the high ground, spamming Eldritch Blast. You'll notice I'm kind of glossing over most of the fights this early in the game, and that's not by accident. We're not a high enough level to have access to any spells or tactics beyond go on high ground and shoot Eldritch Blast at bad guys, so I've been sparing you guys listening to me narrate that 700 times in a row. But for the sake of posterity, here's a bunch of Eldritch Blasts all cut together in one. We finish things up, and Halson thanks us for saving him, and offers his help in eliminating the rest of the goblin leadership. We decline, of course, insisting we can handle things on our own, and then immediately go take a nap. Morning comes, and we decide to start our day with a healthy breakfast consisting of tadpoles and nothing else. With our full illithid potential unlocked, we make our way over to Night Warden Minthara. Using Minor Illusion, we group up a few of her henchmen as well as her scrying eye onto the bridge before blowing the support beams out with Eldritch Blast and sending them all plummeting to the Underdark. We leave Minthara alive, for now, because we smell on her an illithid tadpole similar to the ones we just ate, and we're hungry for more. With that small bit of critical thinking out of the way, we're back to the old reliable strategy of stand in high place and shoot Eldritch Blast. It isn't long before Minthara and the remaining goblin war chief are not but corpses on the ground, and we're eating more tadpoles. Our mid-morning snack grants us the ability to magically charm our foes in combat, and it also imbues us with the confidence needed to take down Dror Ragslin. 
Fortunately for us, we aren't the only things in this complex that want a piece of him. The spiders he keeps locked in the dungeon seem more than willing to help us take him down in exchange for their freedom. So we bust them out of the cage, and then, you guessed it, we're back on the high ground, casting darkness. We start things off with a bang. And the fight seems to be going in our favor until Dror Ragslin, in a rare moment of clairvoyance for an NPC, not only recognizes our advantage, that being standing on the high ground, but also takes steps to mitigate it, those being throwing sharp sticks at us until we are no longer on the high ground. In an effort to remedy the predicament in which we now find ourselves, we turn invisible and scramble to reposition while Dror Ragslin engages in perhaps the most gratuitous act of overkill I've ever seen and absolutely fucking wallops our familiar. As saddened as I'm sure we all are to see him die, we can take comfort in the fact that his sacrifice was not in vain, as, in killing him, Dror Ragslin has managed to softlock himself. When we emerge from invisibility, we find him standing there, perched atop the doorframe, Unable to advance, yet unwilling to retreat, he remains motionless as we chip away at the remainder of his HP, and our spider friend lands the killing blow. We eat his tadpole before reporting back to Halson. Thrilled with our heroics, he invites us to speak with him further at the Emerald Grove, an offer which we graciously accept, right after we loot the place for all of its gold. And rations. And smoke powder. We return to the Emerald Grove just in time to see Halson calling Kaga a bitch and collect our reward from the druids. We also stop by the tieflings, who we invite to spend the night at our camp throwing a party in celebration of their newfound safety. It wasn't until this moment that I realized just how lonely this game gets when you murder all the companions. We don't have that many people to talk to, so we call it an early night. Morning comes, and we waste no time making our way to the Underdark, and, coincidentally, the next boss fight. This time, a spectator. We blast one of the statues from far away to avoid the surprise condition before starting the fight in earnest. The key here is to control the action economy. A spectator on its own is already a difficult fight, but a spectator surrounded by an army of drow assassins is an impossible one. Fortunately for us, the spectator's charm can be broken by any tick of damage. Magic Missile works great here, but as a warlock we don't have it, so we have to rely on Void Bulbs and the occasional Eldritch Blast. We end up switching enough of the drow over to claim victory against the spectator. Regrettably, only one of them survives. Sorry boys, thanks for your help. I'll be sure to look into that forge you were talking about. The Underdark is already proving treacherous, so we opt to take things a little more carefully going forward. We even manage to put our bloodlust aside for a moment and sneak past this group of minotaurs instead of killing them. When we get to the Mykonid colony, we make an alliance with them and set our sights on the Dwergar invaders that recently attacked their colony. Much like the last fight, the name of the game here is Action Economy. Unfortunately, unlike the last fight, we don't have any methods of swinging the pieces in our favor, so we're going to have to come up with something else. We notice an overhang from one of the pathways above that looks out onto the battlefield, and, using the necklace we got earlier, we're able to misty step up there and rain Eldritch Blast down on the bad guys. Now, while we've got some time, as you're busy watching what amounts to a real-life hour of me spamming Eldritch Blast and wishing I could skip the enemy turns, I wanted to talk to you about something. And that is that moments like these are what really made me love doing this lone wolf run. You know, the fights that you could in no way ever win if you took them head on, where you're just completely overwhelmed, yet using the power of your prefrontal cortex you're able to outthink the enemies and put yourself into an unlosable situation. Oh. He can teleport. Fuck. You know what, forget that first thing, I'd like to take a moment to talk about something else, and that's the F5 button. Praise the F5 button, for without it, I would have lost my sanity weeks ago. We reload our quick save and knock the shit out of him. Let's go get near. He's bound to be a tough fight, but we still have an ace up our sleeve, and that is the fact that we just hit level 5. Two beams on Eldritch Blast, proficiency bonus goes up to 3, access to 3rd level spells, and an extra invocation. Those last two are going to combine to form quite the potent combo. The spell we're going to select is Hunger of Hadar, and the invocation we're taking is Repelling Blast, and let me spell it out for you. Hunger of Hadar is a massive, damaging, blinding, slowing AoE that enemies can't get out of, and Repelling Blast is an invocation that lets us knock enemies wherever we want, say, into Hunger of Hadar. As one of the most unlikable pricks anybody has ever met in their life, it goes without saying that Nier has quite a few people that want to kill him, and we make fast friends with a few of them. We roll up to the rock fall he managed to get trapped behind, bust him out of it, and he immediately starts being an asshole. We put a stop to that shit quick fast and combat starts up. 
A few of these dwarves seem predisposed to standing next to lava, so thanks to our new invocation Repelling Blast, we're able to deal with them quite easily. Once the fight develops a little more, we notice that most of the enemies seem to be congregating towards the center, including near himself, which seems like a great opportunity to test out our new spell, Hunger of Hadar. We throw it down, and the rest of the fight pretty much plays itself. Nobody's able to get close enough to pose any melee threat to us, and their ranged attacks are nothing compared to Eldritch Blast. A couple of our dwarven allies get caught in the crossfire, but let's be honest, it's not like they're great people to begin with, so not a huge loss. We take Nier's head as a souvenir and free the gnome slaves from the Cult of the Absolute. Oh hey, it's Windmill Guy. How's it going, buddy? And with that, we're on to the final boss of the Underdark. With over 400 hit points, immunity to most types of damage, and the ability to one-hit us in a single turn, it's safe to say that things are looking pretty... grim. I'll be honest with you guys for a second, I wiped like 30 times on this boss, and before you say anything, I know, I know, you can just have a familiar activate the boss fight while you sit up on high ground and blast him to pieces. I wanted to try doing it this way. And then I was too stubborn to stop, so I'll walk you through the winning strategy. As I'm sure most of you are aware by now, you can bait Grimm into taking two hits from the forge hammer by standing in a certain spot and clicking the lever twice in a row. However, invariably, after the second time, he gets up and kicks your ass, so this isn't going to work for the entire fight. What we end up doing is throwing Hunger of Hadar down on the imps that spawn in to get them to fuck off, and then using the Misty Step we took off of Nier's corpse, thank you Disintegrating Nightwalkers, to split the battlefield in half, throw a Hunger of Hadar down to lessen his movement so that he ends up ending his turn right on top of the Forge Hammer, and then Eldritch Blasting it for the kill. I'm embarrassed by how long it took me to figure this out, but hey, we got there. Our reward for our efforts is the adamantine shield. Not the best thing you can make at the forge, but the only thing we can actually use. As a warlock, we're not proficient in medium or heavy armor, and weapons aren't much use to us, so we slap it on and take refuge in the fact that we can no longer be critically hit. The next boss on the list is Auntie Ethel, but before we take her on, we want to stop by our friend Volo for a little bit of reconstructive surgery. <laughs> With Sea Invisibility active, we stroll into the Hag's lair, kill all but one of the possessed heroes, and go downstairs to confront her. We first turn ourselves invisible, stroll on up to the back of the arena, detect her, thanks to Folo's new eye, before drinking a haste potion and unloading. The reason we kill all but one of the possessed heroes is because if we don't, then Ethel summons her clones on round one instead of them. This way we don't have to deal with the whole person spam for at least another round. To make things interesting, we also summon some help of our own. Remember the ogres from earlier? Me too. How's it going, boys? They show up and immediately start causing an abundance of chaos. Lump, for some reason, perceives Mayrina as the biggest threat on the battlefield and just fucking obliterates her with an acid arrow as soon as he spawns in. Yeah, sorry about that one, Marina. I'm no hero. We aren't able to blow Ethel up quite fast enough to stop her from summoning her clones at all, but we just throw up the darkness spell and let them duke it out with the ogres for a while. We pick them off one by one, and eventually Ethel gets weak enough to trigger the bargaining scene with us. As a warlock, we're more than happy to trade her life in exchange for more power, and put the plus one into charisma. With a free plus one in our charisma, we decide it's time to hit up our boy Withers for the first respec of the campaign. We trade out the ability score improvement we took at 4th level for the resilient constitution feat. All the strategies we employ in combat rely on concentrating on spells, and right now we suck at doing that. Proficiency in constitution saving throws goes a long way towards making sure we can keep our spells up, so we're happy to take it. With Ethel dealt with, at least temporarily, that's pretty much all we have to do in Act 1, right? Does the Githyanki crash count? I can never tell. Fuck it. Time for a lightning round. We roll up to the abandoned Temple of Lathander that is now serving as a gift crash, and the drunk kobolds guarding the entrance are no match for the Hunger of Hadar spell, so we kill them all. Our familiar even gets in on the action and takes a few down themselves. Then we head upstairs to the Dawn Master crest puzzle and solve it by placing all the ceremonial weapons on the correct pedestals. After that, it's down to the basement, where the crash is located. We talk our way past the guards and head inside to do some shopping. The most notable purchase we make is for the Blackguard Gauntlets. They let us switch our ranged spell attacks to melee ones, meaning we no longer have to run away or misty step when the enemy gets on top of us. <sighs> 
Then we steal the key to the sonic barrier from the Kithrak and go inside to have a chat with Grand Inquisitor Wargas. Just kidding, we kill him and all his friends by funneling them into a choke point and dropping Hunger of Adar on their heads to keep them in place while we blast them to pieces. Blacketh shows up and congratulates us before telling us to enter the Astral Prism and kill our guardian. We don't roll like that, so we tell her to fuck off and try to leave. The Gith are upset by this and we have to negotiate our way out. With spells. Also, in-game, I forgot to do the Tyrans until, like, right at the end of Act 1, so we go clean those guys up. We're level 5 when the fight happens, so there's really not much strategy to it beyond throwing Hunger of Hadar at them and laughing as they fail to get out of it. Also, we have to put Karlak down. Thanks for watching!